Okay, so today I'm going to show you a checkmating pattern. A couple weeks ago I showed you back rank mates, and today I'm going to show you a different checkmating pattern. And for that, I am on Lee Chess, and I've loaded up a game between Hikaru Nakamura, okay, who you probably recognize as one of the uh, best chess players in the world, and his opponent is Dragan Solak, who was a, is a Turkish grandmaster. So at the time, Hikaru Nakamura was rated 2778. Dragan Solak was rated 2599, so grandmaster, but obviously Nakamura is rated higher. And this was played at the Chess Olympiad in 2012 in Turkey, and Mr. Solak is Turkish. So this game was played at the Olympiad, and I chose this game for a couple of reasons. First, the Olympiad uh, occurs every four years, and it just ended, like yesterday. And the United States won the gold medal in the Chess Olympiad for the first time since 1976. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, and there were a lot of good games played there, and I hope that you'll keep up with it. But this game was played in 2012, so not this Olympiad, but the one before it. And it has a pattern in there that I want you to see. It's a pretty instructive game, too. Nakamura does win. He's the white player, and he does win. We're going to look how. Okay, G3 is how we start. There are a lot of different openings that can start G3, but you're going to see quickly what Nakamura chooses. Okay, G3, Knight F3, Bishop G7, and then no, and then we're going to expect. There we go, D D3. Nakamura is playing what we call the King's Indian attack. Now there is a defense for Black called the King's Indian defense, and it looks a lot. The setup looks a lot like this, only. You t move the black pieces like the white pieces are moved now. The King's Indian attack. Warren did a lecture on the King's Indian attack, and then he did another lecture on illustrative games in the King's Indian attack. And if you're interested in learning the King's Indian attack, you should watch those videos. They're on my YouTube channel. But here's why the King's Indian attack is so cool. You can pretty much make these moves as white, these first four moves that Nakamura has made. Doesn't matter what black does. Doesn't matter. The only move that would really cause you some sort of concern is if black actually moved this pawn up here somehow, some way, to threaten your knight. But then you can take it with this pawn, and then this pawn takes, and then all of a sudden your knight is attacked. That's the only way that black can kind of throw a wrench in your plans. But the nice thing about the King's Indian attack at your level, and this is going to sound a little weird, but the people that you're going to play aren't going to know it. They're not going to know what you're doing. They're not going to know what this is called. They're not going to know the ideas behind it. They're not going to know what to look out for. It's an uncommon sort of um, opening, but it's very solid, the King's Indian attack. It's something to look into. OK, so Nakamura is playing the King's Indian attack. Fine. His opponent, he's getting out his light squared bishop. Why is he getting out his light squared bishop? Because soon he's going to move this pawn up here, and then he can't get his light squared bishop out anymore. So he's getting it out now. All right. So what white's going to do is just going to castle. These are the first five moves of the King's Indian attack. You can make it pretty much nine times out of ten in a King's Indian attack, and you're going to be just fine. Okay. So if you don't know what to do in the opening, make these five moves in this order, and then play. See what happens. All right. Now, next, black, like I said, is going to move his pawns in this kind of structure right here. And this defense for black is called the London system. Now, you don't need to know that, but if you're curious, that's what it's called. It's called the London system. Now, what white is going to do is white is going to try to make his light squared bishop one of the most powerful pieces on the board. How is he going to do that? Yeah. By um, trying to take out the pawns, the black's pawns in d5 and c6. Not necessarily. Um, I understand what you're saying. You're saying if you take out this pawn, these two pawns right here, that you can, um, that you can make this bishop much more powerful. But no, really, the best way to make this bishop really powerful is to take away its opponent, Black's light squared bishop. So that's what you're going to see Nakamura do. Knight h4, attacking this bishop. Now Nakamura would gladly trade this knight for this bishop, because that would give Nakamura both bishops, and both bishops is considered an advantage. If you ever watch Warren present, he's a big advocate of having two bishops. And if you ever watch, I was watching Peter Spidler, who's one of the top Russian players, in a banter blitz session from earlier, just a couple days ago, and he was talking about the power of the two bishops. You know, professional players really like those two bishops. So Naka's going to try to trade, trade his knight for that bishop. And 
his opponent moves his knight back to g6. Now, you could still trade, but the idea now is instead of taking with this pawn, we can take with this pawn. And black feels that that's better. But Naka is perfectly happy trading, so he trades. Now, black has a slight little thing going on with his rook on what we call a semi-open file. This file, this vertical line right here, is semi-open, which means no black pieces are blocking it, and it has a target. Obviously, you can't take down there because king will take, but in the future, it could give black some attacking ideas. The disadvantage is that if black chooses to castle kingside short, it's going to make his position a little weak because he doesn't have this pawn defending. Right? So Nakamura continues developing. Eventually, he's going to attack the center, but right now he's kind of positioning his pieces, this piece, covers the center, this piece covers the center. All right, he's getting his pieces active. And now he strikes out the, at the center with e4. Now there's a couple reasons Nakamura does this. If you're castled and your position is safe, opening the center usually is a good idea because his opponent is not castled. So he's going to try to open up the center to create some attacking ideas. So we have takes and takes. Okay, we take with the pawn. And then black decides that they're going to prevent this pawn from moving forward by moving his own pawn forward. And the idea is to keep, it, keep him from having any sort of attacks against this knight or ideas like that. Now, this is probably not black's best idea. If you look at it with a computer, the computer will say, well, move the queen up here, and then you can castle queenside. And that probably would have been a better long-term plan for black in this game. Castling queenside is safer because the king side is exposed, okay? And a king's Indian attack usually launches an attack on this side of the board, okay? So if you castle on the other side, it could be a little bit safer. That would have been a better long-term plan. But instead he chose to block, and Nakamura just gets his queen out, gets it developed. Sometimes in chess, and this is something Warren talks about a lot, if you're not sure what to do, take your worst piece, the piece that's doing the least for you, and make it better. And that's what Naka's doing. He's saying, you know what? My queen on this square, really all that queen did is looked over that pawn. But that's not doing much. So I'm going to get my queen out, and my queen is now going to have the ability to defend this pawn and to move out here and to do all sorts of things, maybe move up here and then move over here or something. But it gives the queen a lot more mobility. So he's just improving it. He's also one step closer to getting his rooks connected. Okay, and that's an important idea. Getting your rooks communicating is the technical term, the chess term. So that they can defend each other. That's one of the simplest reasons. And works, rooks work really well together when you're using them both for the same idea. We're going to see that a little later. Team Warren, remember when I, I protected my rook and you couldn't take it with the queen and I found it with your checkmate? That's why. Okay, so Black is getting his bishop out, he's developing, and he's just clearing the way to castle kingside, which I've already said I don't think is the best of ideas, but I'm not a grandmaster, so I'm going to defer to his wisdom here. Let's just say that he's hoping to defend this position a lot better than I think I could. I would be very scared about castling kingside with my pawn structure like that. And Nakamura is going to move this knight to get his bishop moving, and to start migrating his pieces to this side of the board. He's just trying to get more pieces over to this side of the board because that's where he's going to attack. Okay, moving on. Now we get the queen c7 idea. Queen to a more active square. h4, nice move. What is h4 trying to do? Yeah. Which pawn? This pawn? Yes. Well... That's not really why. That's a good thought, but that's not really why. Yeah, Timor? Because the queen's in a position that if the pieces are all clear out of the way, the queen would be pointing in h2, and the, the rook is on an open file there. Here? Yeah. Okay. So it could threaten checkmate there. Okay, so the, the white is trying to think of how to defend h2, and is trying to put obstacles in the way from the, the rook and the queen to get to h2. That's one idea. There's actually another idea that Nakamura has, which is even more clever, and you're going to see it on his next move. So black castles. 
I've already gone on record to say that I don't think Castle and Kingside is the best idea, particularly against Takara Nakamura in this position. But um, this is not me playing. I think here is why Naka really made this move. The first reason why he made this move is to get his bishop to a more active diagonal. Now you notice that this bishop, when it's here, it doesn't really do much. The knight's blocking it, the pawn's blocking it, and the pawn's never really going to move because this other pawn's in the way. Um, and then these pawns over here can't really do anything against that. But if it moves to this diagonal, all of a sudden this bishop influences some squares. So in this spot, the bishop influenced one square, two squares, and defended two squares. So let's say it defended four. It, did, it had impact on four squares. Now it has impact on one, two, three, four, five, six squares. It's more powerful. It has more options. The bishop is better placed on this square because it's more active. It's not the only reason why we move it there, and we'll see that soon. Okay, black is going to just develop this rook to um, protect this pawn because this pawn is attacked once by the knight. It's defended once by this knight, but it also means this knight can't move because it's tied down to defending this pawn. But now with the rook here, this knight can move elsewhere. And we're going to see where it moves in a bit. King g2. Now, partly this is Nakamura saying, okay, I got time. I'm just going to play king g2 and see what you do. And part of it is to get his king on a more active, uh, a better square. Now, it may not look like it right now, but this h file right here is what Nakamura is looking at. And he knows that if he can get his rook over to h1, then he can have it attack on the h file. But he needs the king out of the way. So he's just getting the king out of the way to do it. All right, now the knight's moving. It's moving to f8. The knight is going to try to defend this side of the board because Naka has moved one, two, three attacking pieces to this side of the board, and soon it's going to be four. And this bishop could get there at any time. That's maybe five. So he's going to try to mobilize some defenders. Right now he only has one, two, right? So he's got to work on that. All right, so now Naka is going to start getting all aggressive. This rook develops, it needs to go somewhere. It's not doing anything right there, right? It needs to go to an open file. So putting your rook on an open file is typically a great idea. Unfortunately, the action is not going to happen in the center of the board. It's going to happen on the side of the board, mostly. A3, Naka saying, I got time. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to take your bishop, and I'm going to remove its possibilities from moving here. And later on, maybe I want to play b4 and chase your bishop away. And now I can do that. Okay. Moving queen to a better square, getting this bishop out, okay, doing something, and connecting these rooks, something I said we needed to do a while ago. So you see, we've identified these problems. They were a while ago, but now he's actually addressing them, and he knows that he's got time to do it. Okay, so now we're getting our knight more involved, moving our rook to a better square, taking that knight, and recapturing. You have two options. Do we capture with pawn, or do we capture with bishop? Yes? Uh, bishop. We do capture with bishop. Why? Because it prevents this knight from moving or else the queen falls. Right? It's pinned. This knight is pinned. So that's kind of annoying. And you don't have to worry about this bishop being challenged because the only way it can be challenged is if this knight moves and this pawn moves up. But we've already identified as soon as this knight moves, the bishop takes the queen. So to challenge this bishop to get it to move, you have to either like move the knight back here or you have to move the queen over, and then the knight over, and then the pawn up. It's really difficult to kind of challenge this bishop. Okay, shuffling the queen around a little bit, and h5. Another reason we play h4 is so we can play h5. Naka is going to open up that h file. So watch, takes. And you're probably thinking, okay, I'll just take that pawn back. But you can't because the knight's protecting it. So let's take out the knight. And this has the added advantage of exposing the king even more. Now, you see how loose this king is? The king has zero pieces defending it. Naka has two pieces on that side of the board, and he's about to have a third and maybe even a fourth. This is good positionally for Hikaru Nakamura. So you can take the pawn back immediately, but you don't have to. This pawn, not going anywhere. Don't worry about it. You can take it later. So Naka finds an even better move. Emmanuel Lasker, one of the best world champions of all time, said, when you find a good move, try to find a better move. And what, so what Nakamura does is he moves his bishop here, where his bishop is a beast. 
This bishop is a monster, and I want to explain why. Remember earlier, it influenced six squares, and I said that was better? Now let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight squares. Eight squares is bigger than six. This bishop's even more powerful, and this bishop cannot be removed. How? Tell me, how are you going to remove this bishop? How are you going to chase this bishop away? You have to um, bring in your queen or your pawn. I mean, not, not your, your pawn, your queen or your rooks can't. Well, and guess what? It's going to be a pawn. We'll take another piece and now... You, you can't. This bishop is stuck there. And because this bishop is stuck there, you can't advance these pawns either. You could take it if the king just, like, moved around the whole... Board. Yeah, if you, like, shifted your... Dun, 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 and then somehow you could take this pawn and then the bishop, but the pawn's protecting it, so for right now, you and can't do anything. Is, the pawn is double yeah, this, this is, a, if you ever see an opportunity to get a bishop or a knight toward the center of the board, and it's protected, and it's really unattackable, do it. You're going to pose your enemies, your opponent, so many problems. Maxine. Pretty much now, Nakamura can just you. Oh, if you really wanted to get the bishop out, what yep. You could sacrifice a queen or a rook, but you might as well just resign. <laughs> yeah. You might as well just resign. Okay, so let's see. I never really resign because, like, there's always a hole. But, yeah, these are grandmasters, so, yeah. yeah. You never know. Yeah. Well, you never know. Uh, so you're going to see something. Like, I know how to yeah. something up, and then you can just go, like, check, 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 okay. check, 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 check. Okay, so his opponent, Ms. GM Solak, realizes this king side is very unsafe. Run. <laughs> Run some more. Run. Get get away. We Run. did. We spent all this time castling. Now get back into the center of the board because this area bad things are going to happen. And now look, Naka is saying I'm not going to take it with the with the queen. Now, you don't want to take this pawn with the queen. There's a simple reason that would allow this rook to go right here and really annoy you. So he's not taking with the queen. He's leaving the queen back to defend. His queen does a good job defending this pawn and does a good job defending this pawn, which is important, and defends these important squares so the rook can't invade. And he's instead going to take it with his own rook. Now, GM Solak's going to challenge it. Question, if you're white, do you take this rook or not? No. no. Why not? Because if you take... Black is going to take with his rook, and then black has control of the h file. You do never want to. You never want to give your opponent control of the file. You want to. You want to force your opponent to give you control of the h file. Yes, Jack. Well, still, you're, even if you're, if you're like, you're, even if your rook has an h1, if you can move it to h1. Uh huh. Your right now. You could, but then if he takes, your king has to go to h1, and then your king has to spend a whole move getting back toward the center of the board. You're losing time. Toward the end of the game, you really want your king to be able to mobilize toward the center of the board. So any moves you spend moving the king away is going to cost you time later on in an, in an end game, if this goes to an end game. And most GM games do go to end games. So Naka does not take it. Instead, he makes this lovely little move, g4. Now, he doesn't have to. He defends the queen, or he defends the rook with his queen, right? Queen defends. But I've already said, rook takes, queen takes, then this rook can play to d2, and you don't want that to happen. So instead, he just defends with the pawn. Lovely move. Yeah. Well, if you get the pawn over there, it'll also defend the knight. It'll what? It'll defend the knight. It'll be the bishop. What knight? The bishop. Oh, the bishop. Yeah, it defends the bishop, too. It's the second defender for the bishop, but really it's there to defend the rook. Now, it's a third if... Defender. If the opponent, sorry, if Mr. Solak, sorry, let me go back to this position. If he takes the rook, pawn takes, and you have what's called an outside passed pawn. Outside passed pawns are very, very powerful. An outside passed pawn on the fifth rank is about as strong as maybe a knight. By the time it's to the seventh rank, it's as strong as a rook. That pawn is worth the same as a rook if you can get it up to the seventh rank. Because on the eighth rank, it becomes a queen, right? So it, an outside pass pawn is extremely powerful and extremely annoying. And you can imagine that um, he did not want to allow Nakamura to have that, so he didn't take. 
Instead, he kind of puts a threat on this pawn, which is not too big of a threat, but Naka just moves his king up there to tie everything together. This pawn's defended, this pawn's defended, now the bishop's defended, now the rook's defended. And you have no what we call counterplay. Black has no prospects. What's he going to do? I mean, maybe you could move this rook to this square, and you could try to trade that way, but it's not going to work. He's just going to take, and then pawn takes, and then your pawn structure is busted. So at this point, black is kind of out of ideas. And if you look, remember earlier, I talked about this light squared bishop. I want you to understand that Hikaru Nakamura in this game right now dominates the light squares. Look, light square, light square, light square, light square, light square, light square. All of these pieces over here, except this pawn, which is defended twice, is on a light square, which means this dark square bishop can't do crap. This queen, which is currently on a dark square, can't do anything diagonally and can't even move vertically or horizontally because she's blocked by her own pieces, except there, and then the bishop takes. Yeah, so this queen and bishop can't really do anything about these pieces on the light squares, right? So, and, and sometimes you'll hear people say light square weakness, dark square weakness. Naka is trying to be strong on the light squares, and he's succeeding. So where does it go from here? Well, black realizes he can't control this side of the board, so he just gives up on it. And then Naka doubles up rooks, and now it's time to run away, because if he doesn't run away, Naka will take, and then black takes, and then white takes and wins a full rook. So he runs away. And then white invades. Now this pawn is pinned which means the bishop can move here or here, and there's not a darn thing that this pawn can do about it. Now the king can. But, so the, if the bishop moved here, that would be very annoying for black. But Naka actually has a better move in mind later on. Yeah? I'm just going to question. Um, you know at a point the two black rooks were on the sides? Yep, right, right there. Um, if it had been white um, Nakamura thingy? Nakamura, yeah. Nakamura's um, um, game, uh, like a um, turn? Would it have been a good move to play bishop h7? Here? Yeah, to move the bishop to oh, h7. Oh, to move the bishop to h7 to chase off this rook. Um, the problem with that is you're putting your own bishop. I mean, you're not really pinning your own bishop, but it means you can't move this rook anywhere because it's tied down to the defense of your bishop. Yeah. You don't really want to constrain your rook that way because eventually, like if this pawn were pinned, you might have ideas to take this pawn, yeah. right? Um, and you can't do that if your rook's stuck defending there, although it does come with checks, so maybe. But, but no, you don't want to tie down your rook to the defense of a bishop just to chase, just to chase this rook to a square it wanted to go to anyway. Yeah, don't, chase your, don't spend time chasing your opponent's pieces to squares they wanted to go to anyway. So now we invade, and black is in deep trouble. Because if white has his way, white's going to try to get maybe this rook up here. Maybe the queen's going to maneuver and attack this pawn somehow, some way. And black is going to be in a world of hurt. It's going to lose material or get checkmated. So let's see how Nakamura finishes the game. Well, black is trying to get something going. He's trying to get some semblance of what we call counterplay. So he moves his queen out. But this actually proves to be a very big mistake. And Nakamura is going to win here very quickly, but I want you to think this through. If white could make two moves in a row from this position, what would white do? Yes? Um, pawns, uh, C4, then B4, then take the queen? Okay. He's, but he's already, and even if he only has one move, he's... Okay. Um, well, B4 four. looks tempting, but, but queen could take on A3 with check. Yeah, that's the problem with that particular move. Normally, you'd think b4 forks the queen and the bishop, and it does if you don't have a way to move it with check, and he does. So b4 is not the correct plan here. I'm going to show you Naka's next move, this. Oh, now, if Naka can make one more move right now, what would he do? Um, well, I would move the bishop. I think he should move the bishop to g6. No, move the bishop to g6. No, no. You, you have better. Yeah. Um, checkmate uh, queen... So if the queen moves to e6 right now, it's checkmate. Yes. yes. Yes? So his opponent needs to react to that move. Yeah? yeah. Well, sometimes even grandmasters make mistakes. Boy. Boy, you're just nasty. Hey, he says, hey, let's trade queens. Come on, let's trade queens. And Nakamura says, I have a better idea. I'm going to checkmate you. Well, that's, I don't know. Trading queens would have 
been better. And his and uh, his opponent. And this is this is like you. Sometimes you get checkmated, and you're like, I didn't even see that coming. Yeah, that can happen to grandmasters too. Normally they would resign well before this point, but here he didn't even see it coming, and he got checkmated. I I would like to see the expression on his face, but. He got checkmated in a very interesting way. This particular pattern that we see, where the king is blocked by, from escaping by his own two pieces. pieces. The king could escape here or could escape here, but he's got pieces on both of those squares. This type of checkmating pattern is called an epaulette mate. Epaulette, E-P-A-U-L-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. And those of you who speak French probably understand it comes from yeah. shoulders. Epaule, right? Epaulette, it's, it was also um, yes. the thing that military people wore on their shoulders for decorations, right? An epaulette mate, because these rooks act as kind of shoulders, keeping the head from moving out of the way. And, and, now, and now the king is dead. So this is an epaulette checkmate. Now, I wanted to show you this game for a couple reasons. It's a cool game. And Hikaru Nakamura won this game. And he did it with an, a checkmate, which is rare. And he did it with an epaulette mate. Right, so um, that's the end of this game. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, or I'm going to stop the recording.